Hi there, my name is Adam Cook and I'm your host for Talil 24-7. This is our second show and we're very, very pleased with the response we've gotten from you viewers for our first show, so we hope you like what we've got for you in the next little while. We'll also update you on what's happening with the fitness center at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center now that the Cape Breton YMCA has left the facility. And we'll have our feature interview with the YREACH program's Immigration Settlement Officer, Trina Sampson. But we begin this week's show at the Port Hastings Rotary. It's been the center of many discussions over the years as to how best to handle traffic. Well, now, a joint effort led by Port Hawkesbury Mayor Brenda Chisholm-Beaton and the CEO of the Cape Breton Partnership, Carla Arsenault, aims to replace the Port Hastings Rotary with something brand new that could help traffic and also promote Cape Breton communities to tourists. Let's go to the Port Hastings Rotary now for this update. The Port Hastings Rotary. It's one of Cape Breton's key entrance and exit points, and it's been that way for decades. It's responsible for 70% of all the traffic coming into and leaving Cape Breton Island, and that accounts to about 9,000 vehicles every day. But for a long time, some people have been wondering if the Port Hastings Rotary needs an upgrade or an outright replacement. And that's where the idea of the Strait of Canso Causeway Gateway comes in. Oxbury and the Cape Breton Partnership have been busy over the last six months trying to drum up support for the Causeway Gateway Initiative. They've appeared before Richmond, Inverness and Victoria County Councils and gotten support from all three. As well, Mayor Chisholm Beaton brought the idea to the Cape Breton Unamagi First Nations Chiefs during an early September meeting, and she's also appeared before Budledek First Nation Council. So far, so good, and Mayor Chisholm Beaton is hoping to be able to appear before the councils in Wagmacook and Wakoba, as well as the Cape Breton Regional Municipality in the not-too-distant future. Being able to maximize the benefits of each one of those gateways uh, and the different ways that we're welcoming uh, citizens and visitors to Cape Breton in, in Unamagi by land, air or sea. I mean that does benefit the entire island if we get each one of those gateways in a, in a plus position and maximize uh, our ability to welcome more people and have that um, amazing first impression because first impressions are very important. Now, it would be one thing to say that Cape Breton's municipal governments and Aboriginal communities are coming on deck to support the Strait of Canso Causeway Gateway Initiative, but according to Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton, Port Hawkesbury officials are also getting a warm reception from engineers and the minister within the Nova Scotia Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Chisholm Beaton says she's had discussions with Minister Lloyd Hines in recent weeks, in which he's expressed an interest in taking a look at what can be done to enhance or even replace the Port Hastings Rotary, and recent discussions with engineers and officials within the Department of Transportation have also suggested to Chisholm Beaton and her Port Hawkesbury colleagues that the plan could potentially go on the official list for Nova Scotia's five-year highway infrastructure plan. And even if that doesn't go ahead right away, Chisholm Beaton is optimistic that Cape Breton's major entrance and exit point could be getting an overhaul in the not-too-distant future see it as a, a great opportunity to take a project that they are planning to do uh, regardless of where this project goes um, so that five million dollar investment uh, at the Strait of Canso can be used to leverage for a broader project. So for example um, if if TIR is going to be in making that investment you know we can take their share of that project and combine it with other elements of, of a, pro a broader project. Um, we could look at streetscapes, we could look at uh, facade, signage, wayfinding, uh, we could look at poten the potential for um, establishing a new new tourism piece of infrastructure that, that it's going to create an experience at our gateway that's you know will be part of the welcome to Cape Breton in Unamagi. Um, there are all kinds of uh, opportunities I think that we can discuss. For decades, the Port Hastings Rotary has been at the center of discussions being held at three levels of government about a potential highway bypass that would take motorists around the communities of Port Hastings and Port Hawkesbury. 
While it looks like those talks are on hold for the time being, the potential development of a causeway gateway strategy has Mayor Chisholm Beaton and her colleagues suggesting that, in the mayor's words, the stars are aligning for this type of development to go ahead soon. From the Port Hastings Rotary, for Telil 24-7, I'm Adam Cook. If you're watching this show for the first time, the chances are pretty high that you've just moved to the Strait of Canso. After all, there have been hundreds of people relocating to this area from around the world for the past 25 years and even beyond that. But if you've just arrived and you're trying to figure out the best way to connect to local services, and then especially trying to figure out the best way to connect to local employment opportunities, what will you do? Well, you might just want to speak to my next guest here on Tell Ill 24-7. She is the Immigration Settlement Officer for the Y-REACH program located at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center, and her name is Trina Sampson. Trina, we're very happy to have you. Welcome to Tell Ill 24-7. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. I'm really excited to be here. All right. Well, we're excited to have you here because you've got a lot to talk about, and I'd like to begin by getting you to give us a, a bit of a commercial kind of a breakdown of what why reach does what exactly does the program sure. do sure so why reach is immigration settlement and exactly that's what it is so if you're a newcomer and you're coming to Cape Breton Island my area basically is Inverness Richmond and part of Victoria County right up to Bedeck and what I do is I help immigrants settle within the area um, that could be with regards to getting a Canadian driver's license to drawing up their resume, possibly it is starting up an, a business in the area, and I even go as far as going in the classroom with immigrated children to help them with their studies. Now, a big reason we wanted to have you in is because I think there are a lot of folks who've lived here for a long time that don't understand how difficult it can be for someone who's just moved to the area. So can you give us a, just a couple of examples, not naming names, of course, but of instances where you've seen someone come to you with something that we might take for granted, having lived here for a long time, but might be a little more difficult for someone who's just come to the area from another country? Right. It's interesting because... We're fortunate that um, our primary language is English and French. Uh, we can get by uh, as being from this community. But if you are not a, an English or French speaker, sometimes you can face a lot of challenges. Language is so important for so many people, and it, it affects your social being, it affects your employment, it affects uh, your learning. So. Uh, Hugely, language can be number one issue that people will come see me because Why Reach does offer free English classes in the straight area. Well, that in itself is very helpful as well. And one thing I did want to ask you about too is about the ways that you can connect people to employers who might be interested in hiring folks from different parts of the world who have settled in the area to increase the diversity in their employee line as well. And one of the ways that uh, the federal government has launched to be able to put that all together is called the Atlantic Immigration Pilot. That's been going for a few years. Can you give us a bit of background on what exactly that is and how it could be helpful? Yes, it's a wonderful program that, um, a little bit of history on it. So back in 2007, 2007 we had 151,000 people here on Cape Breton Island. Uh, in, within 10 years, so 2017, we were down to 131,000 people. So basically, out migration, uh, baby boomers dying off, uh, have our, our numbers had decreased by about 20,000, and people not having as many children as they used to. So this obviously affects employers, our, it affects our schools closing, um, people cannot find people to work in their businesses, so businesses become seasonal or they close altogether. So the provinces, the Atlantic provinces, went to the federal government and said, this is so important, uh, we really need people to come in and, and grow Cape Breton Island, and not just Cape Breton Island, but all of Atlantic Canada. So they put together a proposal and they went to the federal government and said, can we try this pilot program of bringing newcomers in uh, for full-time employment, filling the job needs, labor, um, right from being maybe uh, working in a restaurant to hotels to truck drivers and helping businesses grow. And so 
it did become a, a pilot program and it has been growing ever since. It started off that the federal government gave each province of the Atlantic provinces 800 people a year. And the 800 people were the candidates, but it also was able to encompass their families. So you might be the person that will be working in the position, but you're able to take your spouse and your children also through the program. So within getting a job offer to actually um, doing your paperwork and coming to start working here, it, you would get your permanent residency within about six months. This was so wonderful and so enticing for so many really great qualified people to come to Atlanta, Canada. Um, since then, the program has grown. Uh, we have uh, 1,200 positions this year to offer to candidates in Nova Scotia. The program actually became full last year by about October. So we were waiting for candidates to be able to push through the program again here in January. So it's full force again. I have seen success in it. I have seen people come, they are working, they have received their permanent residency, they have brought their children, now their spouse may be working in the area. So it's been a wonderful program. It started as a pilot, but we're really, really hoping that the government continues and it becomes one of the regular programs that uh, brings newcomers to the island. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the growth rate for the Atlantic Immigration Project and for the success that the pilot has had as well, too. Yes. Because uh, I was curious, you were telling me just before we started this conversation that within your office as the Immigration Settlement, immigration settlement Officer, your number of clients has grown over the three years that you've been there. Can you tell me a little bit about that and uh, what you think that means for the future of the area? Absolutely. So I started this position back three years ago at the 1st of February. And uh, when I first started the position, that office, which was in existence about nine months, had 29 active clients. Uh, as of right now, I have 186 active clients. And that may mean I have had clients that have started with me but may not need my services anymore or may only come back to see me in a year's time if they need assistance. But actively right now I have 186 clients. So that in itself shows the growth of newcomers coming to the island, which is wonderful. Uh, a lot of my newcomers, uh, Adam, are entrepreneurs. So they're starting their own businesses here, which is wonderful, and they are employing Canadian-born people. So it's, it's a wonderful off-spin. Uh, not just are they filling through the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program positions that were available that we weren't able to find candidates or people to work at here uh, locally, but um, they're, the growth, they're bringing other newcomers and uh, they're employing people that were born here. And it's, it's wonderful. It's nice to see that come together. That's fantastic. And yeah. beyond the numbers, I wonder if you could speak to just a couple of examples that you might have of personal relationships that you've developed with folks in this area. And I mean, the thing that really sticks out to me personally is the flag raising ceremony that was held just this past year for the Street Area Filipino Society, where the actual Philippine flag was risen above the Fort Hawkesbury Civic Center. So it seems like not only are these communities growing and strengthening themselves here, but the community right here in the Strait is embracing them as well. Absolutely, it is phenomenal. It is, it's heartwarming. So we've been fortunate enough to have a number of Filipinos come to the area and uh, they have created their own society and I'm lucky enough, I feel like I've become family in that uh, organization. I wear my t-shirt proudly <laughs> and uh, we did host an event. I hosted an event at the Fort Hawkesbury Civic Center where I was able to invite not only our Filipino community but also others from the straight area to come and celebrate. So we did a flag raising and we did some cultural things like watching videos of, from the Philippines. We shared food um, and they did dancing and it was a fantastic event. That is just one way we celebrate the different cultures uh, in the straight area. We also, uh, on a regular basis, I host a multicultural potlucks at the Civic Center. So not just my Filipino community, although they, they do take a very strong part in it, but also uh, people from 
many different countries. I would say approximately over 40 countries from the in the area come and they take part in those multicultural potlucks. So you will, members of the community are always welcome. It is open to the public and they will come with a dish of their own tradition. So maybe you were born in Canada, but your ethnic background is Ukrainian. So you bring a Ukrainian meal and we share together. So you may get to try food from the Ukraine, from Germany, from the Philippines, from Mexico, from Jamaica. So, and we celebrate with food, uh, which is always a common ground with many people, but we also celebrate with music and dance. And just, I have a rule that everybody that comes in, before they leave, I ask them to introduce themselves to five people they've never met before. So it makes everybody feel welcome and part of the community. And those friendships grow. So I've been fortunate to be invited to weddings, to baptisms, to someone having a baby at a hospital uh, because they have no other family here. So I feel blessed because I become part of their family and not just myself, but I know notice that people from the Philippines uh, welcome people from Jamaica in their home and local people welcome people from Germany in their home and it just it grows and it's it's amazing and it's welcoming and it feels just great. The welcoming nature of these events I've experienced myself because I was at the Street Area Filipino Society event but also at a couple of the multicultural potlucks as well too so good food and great people over there all the way around. So Absolutely. Good stuff. It's amazing. Uh, I'm glad you talked about the idea of welcoming because uh, you know through your putting your other hat on as a dance instructor for many years how deeply ingrained the Scottish and Celtic traditions are here as well as the Acadian traditions and it's been said more than once that that has been an impediment to a degree to bringing more people in here not so much that we celebrate our tradition but that it's been difficult for Cape Breton as a whole to reach beyond the what's your father's name mentality. Right. That if you're not immediately connected to a family that's been here for generations, you're not necessarily welcomed. Is that attitude changing? Are you see it breaking down in the local communities as people welcome new people in? Honestly, I do see it. Um, and I've had, and I honestly can say I've had family members that I've had to educate on how uh, bringing new people in and how they're not coming here to take anyone's job by any means. They're coming here because there's jobs available and they can't fill them locally. So educating people has been huge for me uh, on why this is happening and um, do I see it change within the culture? Yeah, I think, you know, for myself in my responsibility, it is part of my role to make sure that people feel that I have Scottish background, but I also want others to feel that there's no reason that I can't embrace the Ukrainian background or the German background. Or, and I educate even my own family members on that. And at this point, um, they're very proud to say that, you know, even my own children, I have two in the military and they say, you know, my mom is welcoming people here from other countries all the time and so my children will bring up the fact that yeah there's someone in my platoon that's from Korea or there's someone in my platoon that's from China and it's great it feels good and you can tell that they are proud that's wonderful I'm yeah. glad to hear that yeah. so as we wind down this interview I'll ask where do we go from here uh, what are a couple of the next projects or the next programs that we'll see from Y reach uh, over the next little while uh, is there anything on your dock immediately Absolutely. I'm excited. So coming this June, there is a committee and we are putting together a multicultural festival. Okay. So that is going to happen starting on June the 1st, which is our First Nations Celebration Day. Um, so stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of details. It will be, festival will start on the Sunday and it will end on the following Saturday. Every day there is going to be different cult cultures celebrated within that time 
and in different communities throughout the Strait area. So we have a celebration starting in Port Hawkesbury, but we will also have a celebration ending in Petit de Gras. There will be celebration in Lord Bays, in Chapel Island. There will be celebration in Dundee. So it's going to encompass a whole area of all different cultures. And we're looking forward to everybody coming out to be invited and to pay, take part. So if anybody is interested in helping out, we will never say no <laughs> to an extra set of hands. Um, but it will give people the opportunity to learn about cultures that are already existing here and cultures that are coming into our communities all the time. And celebration of food and dance and music and it's going to be so lovely so i'm really excited about that happening well we're looking forward to that and i'm hoping we'll be able to have our little cameras on hand for Absolutely. a couple of these events as well too and i also wanted to mention adam if you don't mind um, i am the co-chair of the k breton local immigration partnership that is a council of 30 professionals from around Cape Breton Island, and we meet quarterly and in between sometimes. And so the Local Immigration Partnership has put together a website uh, which has a service map. So it's all the services here on Cape Breton Island. So even if you're not necessarily a newcomer from outside of Canada, but you may be a newcomer from British Columbia or Winnipeg, uh, that service map is available to anybody and everybody. So you may be looking for a doctor or a place to get your tires changed. Um, so if you look up the K Breton Local Immigration Partnership, it is under the umbrella of the K Breton Partnership. Uh, there is a website and that service map is there for everyone to use. And I think it's a fantastic tool and I wouldn't want to pass up the opportunity to tell everybody, even if you're a local and you're looking for something, I think it's a great tool for everyone. And um, I, I would hope that people would take advantage of using it. I'm glad you brought that up. That yeah. sounds very handy and very helpful for yes. sure. Yes. Uh, and while we're talking about web links and such, if anybody wants to reach you or reach the Why Reach program, uh, either by phone or email or on the web, how would they do that? So I am at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center. My office is just down the corner by the Shannon Studio. Mm -hmm. They can also reach me via telephone at 902-631-2563, or they can email me at trina.sampson at halifax.ymca.ca. So that's my direct email. That's how we find you, yes. and I'm very glad that we found you here in the green corner for us today on Tell Ill 24-7. Trina Sampson, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Adam. Wonderful. I really appreciate you calling me up, and I love talking about my job. It's fantastic. Well, we're happy to hear about you from you about it, and we hope to hear more in the future about how it's all coming together. Great. Thank all you. Right. Our guest has been Trina Sampson. Uh, she is the Immigration Settlement Officer at the Wireach Office at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center. Stay tuned for more Tell Ill 24-7. There are many different places that you can go to get in shape and to do a regular fitness workout in our coverage area. In Isle Madame, there's Vitalité Isle Madame at the École Beauport facility in Arishat. Over in St. Peter's, right on Grenville Street, there's the Kinnick Cell Fitness Centre. And in Port Hawkesbury, there's a fitness centre at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. Up until just a couple of days ago, it was operated by the Cape Breton YMCA. But things are changing over there right now, and as we'll find out in this next report, town officials are doing what they can to make sure that residents of the town and the surrounding area still have that fitness center to be able to count on for years to come. Let's take you there now. On the morning of Friday, January the 30th, the Cape Breton YMCA issued a press release announcing that it would pull out of the Port Hawkesbury branch at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center as of February 22nd. That would end a 15-year relationship between the YMCA and the Civic Center since the Civic Center opened in 2004. In the release, Cape Breton YMCA officials stated that despite their best efforts to keep revenue rolling in, it was proving too costly to maintain the Port Hawkesbury branch and its various programs. Later that day, the CEO of the Cape Breton YMCA, Andre Gallant, would say it was one of the toughest decisions that he had ever made in his 12 years as head of the Cape Breton YMCA. But it didn't take long for the town to snap into action. The CAO of the town of Port Hawkesbury, Terry Doyle, told last week's regular town council meeting 
that town officials are now investigating with private partners that could potentially come on board to help the town run the facility and also to solicit their advice as to how they could successfully run the fitness centre as well as the programs associated with the YMCA. At the same time, Doyle confirmed that town officials are now finalizing a survey which will be going out to Port Hawkesbury residents in the coming days, asking them what they'd like from their fitness centre. And Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton expressed optimism after the meeting that the town, which owns most of the fitness centre equipment, would be able to continue to operate the operation in a way that would best serve the thousands of people that use it over the course of the year health and wellness and fitness of our citizens, not just for the town of Port Oxbury, but also for the street region and all the users of that facility. We want to minimize any disruption uh, to uh, the health regimen of, of our citizens and, and their health and wellness. Uh, so as we go forward with exploring short-term solutions, uh, we will keep uh, the public apprised as to, as to the go forward. While the town hasn't taken a negative fatalistic view towards the potential departure of the Cape Breton YMCA over the past 15 years, Mayor Chisholm Beaton suggests the difficulties that have arisen in previous contract negotiations with the Y has prepared the town for the possibility that Port Hawkesbury might have to go it alone to keep the fitness centre running. We want to look at a break-even scenario with regard to operating that facility for the short term. Uh, and then obviously for the long term, we want to look at a plan that's sustainable so that it's not going to put or place some uh, unnecessary financial burden on the shoulders of our taxpayers. Uh, certainly it's important that we do maintain that uh, facility, uh, but it's also important that we look at the, the broad spectrum of users for that facility. It's, it's more than just the citizens of the town, it's being used by the street. Uh, so there really are a lot of factors to consider with regard to long-term solutions. Um, part of that will be um, exploring are there any other private uh, operators that may want to come in and operate that facility uh, or what does it look like if the town were to continue that. And again, it's all about um, sustainability and aiming for a, a break-even scenario so we don't put any undue burden on our taxpayers. But there were um, some requests coming forward with regard to a rent reduction uh, with on behalf of the YMCA. Uh, Cape Breton uh, branch uh, and um, you know we did look at scenarios where the town could uh, participate or collaborate with the YMCA so that you know rather than devaluing the space in terms of the rental amount uh, we could look at uh, assisting the YMCA with growing their their membership base um, so uh, in 2015 we looked at a, a collaborative uh, pilot uh, where we provided some of our other recreation spaces free of use to the YMCA uh, like the art the arts and crafts room, the dance studio, um, some ice time, some pool time, to create a little bit of an integrated model uh, to hopefully attract uh, more clients to the YMCA and, and to make their operation uh, more sustainable. Uh, and we, despite our efforts to achieve uh, some positive results with growing that membership base, uh, that, that wasn't uh, what transpired. Uh, we do, you know, we do thank the YMCA for their years of service. They, they have put in quite a number of years as our operators, our main operators there. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, this is uh, an opportunity to look at the gym facility. Um, to determine with the feedback of our citizens, uh, you know, what does it need to be going forward in the future? How do we create a sustainable model, model around the operations of that facility short term and long term? And at the end of the day, it's like how do we be a service centre that is accommodating the health, wellness and fitness needs of all of our citizens as well as business, as well as, um, you know, being a recreation centre, an education centre, a cultural centre. During this last week of February, the fitness centre at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre will be closed as the Cape Breton YMCA officially removes its presence from the building. However, on Sunday, March the 1st, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the town is hosting an open house at the fitness centre to be able to update residents as to what's going to happen next and to talk a little bit about what they heard during the survey process. In Port Hawkesbury, Fort Hill Ill, 24-7, I'm Adam Cook.
And it's time once again to play the Fast Five here on Tell Ill 24-7. And I can't tell you how excited I am to have our next guest join us for the Fast Five. She is the Immigration Settlement Officer for the Y-Reach Office at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center. She is Trina Sampson. Trina, are you all ready to play the Fast Five? I'm ready, Adam. All right, let's do it. <laughs> okay. First question, coffee or tea? Neither. All right. There <laughs> Water. We go. See, that was easy. All right. Last movie you saw? I don't watch TV per se so much, but I Private Ryan, I think, is something. Saving best. Private Ryan. Saving Private My Ryan. goodness, that's going back. That's a classic. Yeah. All right. Question number three Dream Vacation. Oh, Croatia. Croatia. And Greece, yes. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. The very inventive choices. I like it. If you could be any animal for a day, what would you be? A cheetah. A cheetah. <laughs> yeah. So watch for Trina scampering across Isle Madame, chasing the gazelles away. That's right. All right. And wrapping up the Fast Five, would you rather be a forest or a tree? Oh, I'd rather be the tree. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, the rare cheetah tree. I like yeah. it. That's wonderful. All right. See, that was easy. That Thank was. you, Trina, for playing the Fast Five with You're us. You're welcome, Adam. Thank all you right. for having me. No trouble at all. Trina Sampson on the Fast Five. I'm Adam Cook. Stay tuned for more. Tell Ill 24-7. And that brings us to the end of our very first second edition of Telil 24-7. We hope you've had a good time over the last little while and maybe even learned a thing or two. If you have any ideas for stories that we can cover on Telil 24-7 or for potential interview guests, there are several ways you can contact us. You can reach me directly by email. That address is adam at telil.tv. You can also phone Telil. The phone number is area code 902 226-1928, and please feel free to follow us and comment on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we've got some great news for you. If you'd like to watch Telil 24-7 anytime, you can do that on our Telil Community Television YouTube channel. All episodes of the show, including this one, are going to be available for you to watch whenever you want. For now, I'd like to thank my guest, Trina Sampson, for joining me this week, and a special thanks to our technical crew, Becky Borono and Nick Boudreau. We really appreciate the work you folks are putting into the show. Thanks for tuning in to Tell Ill 24-7. Let's meet back here next Monday night at 7 o'clock for another edition of the show. I'm Adam Cook. Have a great week, everybody.